Hello everyone and welcome back to another book review. Today I am going to be reviewing The Little Book of Mathematical Principles, Theories, and Things by Robert Solomon. This is what the book cover looks like and this book lays out very important parts of math history and math development starting with the invention of numbers in general and going through the seven millennium prize problems posed by the Clay Mathematical Institute and it lays these out in chronological order for the reader to follow. The book may be a little book, but it packs a very powerful punch. I had a great time reading it, so let's talk about this book. But first of all, if you are new here, I post new book reviews almost every single day on both fiction and nonfiction. So if that sounds interesting to you and you want to get a lot more book reviews just like this, especially on math topics, then feel free to stick around. So as already mentioned, this book sets up is set up in chronological order and it takes different things from math history or different discrete moments or discoveries or things that happened in math history for the development and the furthering of the mathematical field and lays them out in chronological order like so. So you will have a topic up at the top, a brief description, and then one to three pages of information. At the top up here, we also have the date and the location the discovery takes place. And these are again laid out in chronological order. So at the very beginning, you're dealing with things that were discussed or discovered or recorded by people in Babylon, such as quadratic equations or the greatest pyramid in Egypt. And then we're going through very modern inventions. I don't want to say inventions, but modern discoveries here. For example, the logistic model in 1976 in the UK. So you can read it from the very beginning to the very end. The author does not shy away from more difficult mathematical topics and also mathematical notation, but everything is totally accessible to someone who completed high school mathematics. So this is not something that if you did not receive specialized training in the field of mathematics, you did not study it at the university level, I think you are going to be totally fine to read this as long as you're comfortable with the occasional bit of mathematical notation. But everything is clearly explained. I just know that some math books avoid mathematical notation because it gives some people the a little bit of fear to see mathematical notation. This one is assuming that you can at least handle seeing it, which is different for all people. Also, I think the author assumes that you have an interest. Robert Solomon is assuming if you read this book, you have a passing interest in mathematics. There are some books out there written about mathematics for the layperson that, and when I say layperson, I mean either someone who is not currently in the field of mathematics in any way and also never received any specialized formal training beyond high school in mathematics. There are some books out there that know people have a fear of math. People don't like math. It's a very maligned subject. A lot of people feel like they can talk about how much they hate math, unlike most other subjects, and most people are going to agree with them. People in general, I feel like, do not enjoy math or have bad memories of learning math in high school, middle school, elementary school, whenever. So there's a whole series of books out there that are designed to cater to those people, designed to cater to the people who have bad experience with math and to get them interested in math again, to show them the interesting side of math, the part of math that wasn't shown to them when they were in school. Books like this are, are it's upside down. Books like this are assuming that you have an interest in mathematics already. We're starting with the idea that you probably have some passing interest to pull this book off. So the book, the author is not going to work to convince you that this field is interesting. Other math books that I've read and reviewed on this channel, such as It's a Numberful World by Eddie Wu, that's just the first one that comes to mind, work to get the reader interested in math as a topic. In this book, the author is assuming you already have a passing interest. I do like that because I am someone who studied math at the college level, so I don't need someone to convince me math is interesting. I already find math inter is interesting. I review books on mathematics on a YouTube channel for fun in my free time, so I don't need someone to convince me that math is interesting, and I don't think this book would do well to someone who doesn't find math interesting completely because there's no desire to kind of prove math is interesting to the reader before the author gets into the subjects. I found the book was very easy to follow, mostly due to the chronological order of things. I don't know if I've ever seen a book so well laid out with the chronology of these different mathematical history events laid out. I just, I really enjoyed it and I felt like it was very clear and easy to use. So as someone who studied math in college, this book felt like I was speed running my degree in certain respects. This is not filled with problems or practice problems or tests or quizzes, but it feels like we hit a lot of the highlights that I remember from learning math, the things that were interesting to me, the things that intrigued me in a very clear and quick order. The author can fit as much detail as is 
needed to introduce a topic in one to three pages, but we're not getting bogged down in the details. So if it's something that doesn't interest you or it's something that just you find confusing, we're quickly moving on from that subject and you can either return to it later or you can just completely ignore it and forget that it exists. I think the format also works because math as a field builds on each other. It's not like some other fields where maybe we totally throw out old ideas when new things are invented, which is a valid way of doing things like I guess maybe trying to think here medicine where we come up with a better way of doing something so we can kind of forget that there was this other way of medicine. Math, like once we talk about trisecting the angles, it was as relevant today as it is in 5th century BC Greece as shown up here. So because math has a very clear building aspect to it that isn't always present in other fields, I think it very it lends itself well to this building aspect. You're never left behind and you're kind of moving along with the pace of the development of mathematics. So you feel like you're building up throughout the book. You never feel like you're jumping from topic to topic too quickly or that you don't really understand. Also, some of these topics, some of these topics, yeah, will reference back to another topic that's already been discussed with the page number, which I just felt like was a, was a really good detail. So the author, again, as I mentioned, does not shy away from more difficult topics, but he keeps the explanation general enough. I was very impressed, pleased to see some stuff in here that usually I would consider, I don't think authors always would include in a book that was maybe designed for someone who wasn't at least a little familiar with it. I did write my page numbers down. So on page 128, we see the Riemann hypothesis, which is here. This hypothesis was explained to me in a class at college in my senior year. And I have to admit, I don't fully know what's going on with it. And after reading this, I still don't fully know what's going on with it, but it is an unsolved problem. So that does make it a little different. It is something that people much smarter than me with much more mathematical aptitude than me are working on solving. But I was impressed that the author included it because I feel like it is quite a technical, even just like the overview of it feels very technical. And the author does admit in the section, the lead up section here, that this is one of the more technical entries in the book. So I just wanted to add that I don't know if I've seen the Riemann hypothesis thrown into a lot of other more casual readers on mathematics, which I would consider this to be. So I was impressed by that. And I also, again, going back to the speed running my degree, I was like, oh, I do remember covering this in the class. I remember exactly where I was sitting in the classroom and the professor who was showing it to me. The other section that I really wanted to point out and that I enjoyed is where this book ended, as mentioned. It ends in the year 2000 in the US, but it's the seven millennium prize problems that were posed by the Clay Mathematics Institute. So these were seven problems that this institute set out as wanting or challenging people to solve in the next 100 years, starting from year 2000. This was modeled after a set of problems that David Hilbert gave in 1900. 1900, yeah, that's correct that he wanted solved for the next 100 years, or a challenge to be solved in the next 100 years. Ironically enough, the Riemann hypothesis was in the original set from nine, 1900. I don't know why I'm struggling with that date. 1900, and also appears again in the year 2000 in these seven Millennium Prize problems. I do have to say, you also get $1 million if you solve any of these. So there is a bit of an incentive for people to solve, besides the general curiosity that, that mathematicians tend to have when wanting to solve these problems. But I was very impressed with the way the author handled this. I've seen the seven millennium prize problems handled in other readers of mathematics. But one thing that I tend to find is the authors kind of stick to two of the pro seven problems. They usually mention the Poincaré conjecture. So this one has actually been solved by as Gregory Perlman, I believe. He did refuse the $1 million prize. I believe he said that his work had built on other people's works that he wanted credited, which is why he didn't want to take the $1 million prize. But books that talk about the seven millennium pro prize problem that is aimed for a just casual reader usually get that one because it's been proven. So it's something they want to talk about. But they also talk about P versus NP, which is a problem that's a little bit easier to solve. The other five problems, they tend to say something along the lines of, and there's other ones, and if you solve them, you get a million dollars. And there's a reason for that. It's because, again, the six of them are at least still unsolved, and five of them are a little bit more difficult, I would say, to explain what exactly is trying to be solved for. And I think the author does a really good job. He actually mentions all seven of the problems and gives a very, 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 very high level. This is very high level explanation of what is trying to be solved in these seven problems. I think that's really impressive because like I mentioned before, a lot of other authors will just, again, they'll cover the two, they'll cover the Poincaré conjecture, which was 
proven or solved and they cover the P versus NP because it's easier to explain and they skip the rest. So I think the fact that the author took the time to list them out, I personally appreciate it and I think it was a really interesting job. I think also if you have any interest in learning more about the other problems, you can go to Wikipedia and you'll see exactly how complicated they are. This was another thing that was actually covered in my mathematics course in I think it was my number theory course the professor just took time one class to break out all seven problems and kind of explain what was being saw or what was trying to be proved and I remember finding some of them quite difficult especially some of these ones that are not normally discussed so I know I authors shy away from discussing them but I'm just very impressed that the author took the time to explain what was happening in this one again very impressed really enjoyed it so overall I think this was a highly highly oh I'm dropping it um, or it was a very well written book. I think it's an excellent start for people who enjoyed math in high school or took math in high school and now have an interest in continuing on. They want to know what wasn't taught to them in high school or they want to learn more about mathematics in general. So they want to kind of take their math reading to the next level. This is a great place to start because of the chronological order, because of the covering of a wide variety of topics and the fact that the author keeps it interesting and engaging throughout the entire book. I highly recommend The Little Book of Mathematical Principles, Theories and Things by Robert Solomon. If this is the first video you're watching from me, I have a whole math playlist if you want to check out, but otherwise I hope you enjoyed this video and I hope you have a great rest.